have the wonderful one and only Susie Dawson joining us today, who has done an amazing job putting this entire thing together. And I don't believe that she has slept at all, really. <laughs> so we're in. I napped, I napped a little bit. I napped a little bit. I napped enough to be awake and able to talk to you guys. So it's cool. amazingly refreshed. I would be a complete <laughs> only an hour and a half of sleep. I'm a bit sweaty because 20 minutes ago. 20, 20 minutes ago, I was slaving over a hot stove cooking spaghetti bolognese, but I'm here and we're fed, so it's all good. <laughs> well, welcome back. Um, so what inspired you to start this massive vigil again? Um, the first vigil that we did um, on March 28 or somewhere around there, uh, which you were also present at, Cassandra, um, that was the original inspiration is that we wanted to show public support for Julian. We wanted to take a stand against the censorship of him and the silencing of his voice. And initially, we just had this really, you know, single purpose of wanting to reconnect Julian to the world. But as the situation, his wider situation, has continued to worsen in the subsequent weeks, we realized that actually we need to take action for far more than just reconnecting him. We actually need to get him out of the embassy big time. Uh, his health is deteriorating rapidly. His doctors have warned that he is at actually a mortal risk in the embassy. Um, the human body cannot live inside of four walls 24-7 with no natural light for seven years as, as he has. Um, that's not sustainable. And so it was pretty clear we needed to try to begin, plant the seed of a mass movement to free him. Because I do believe that only a movement on the scale, you know, that can eventually become on the scale of a free Mandela movement would be able to apply enough political pressure to the governments who are persecuting him. And in order to build a movement like that, it was patently obvious to me that we couldn't do that within a political niche somewhere on the political spectrum. We needed the entire political spectrum to come together to actually set aside their differences, to set aside the divisions, and to unify, to rally around this this primary uh, drive to free Julian, to protect his human rights, to get the censorship removed from him, give, give him back his voice, but ultimately to get him either back to Australia or to Ecuador to realise his asylum. And you've done an amazing job. You really pulled together people from all over the political spectrum. I mean, there's people on here that I can't imagine would ever interact in real life or even on Twitter and you managed to get them all here to speak out for one common goal, which is a beautiful thing. And I'm really happy to see it, especially for Julian. There's, I think there's no greater cause to put everybody together for. Uh, it's, not, it's not always easy to do because it doesn't come naturally to people to seek out you know, people who completely disagree with them or who have opinions that they might find abhorrent or that they might be embarrassed to be seen with. But at the end of the day, that is society. Society is a cross-section of all different opinions. And we need to be able to live together and to get along together and to work together. You, if you apply for a job and you go into a workplace, you don't get to pick the political opinions of the people who you work with. It's just this mishmash, this melting pot. And so why can't we do that in the organizing space? You know, Why can't we work to achieve singular goals together that we all believe in and just put aside our like ego, put aside our own personal preferences just to achieve that, that simple goal. And the mass movements that I've had experience in, in New Zealand, we did, we achieved that, that mass, that critical mass by including everybody. We didn't say, no, you can't come because you are, an anarchist or a green or a conservative or a libertarian or a whatever. We were just said, everybody's welcome. We're against this issue. If you're against this issue, get on board. We don't care who you voted for. We don't care, you know, what party you belong to. If you are with us on this issue, let's get in, let's muck in, let's do it together. And I feel like that's exactly the attitude that we've got to apply in this fight to free Julian. I agree entirely. And I, I think that there's a lot of things that there's huge overlap, um, you know, war and there's just all these things that if people work together and really harness their true power, like we could be 
changing the world, but everybody has just become so polarized that nobody talks and nobody realizes how many things you do have in common. And, you know, I think Julian especially is such a, it should be such a universal cause. Like everybody should believe in the truth. So anyways, I think it's really great that you managed to, to do all this. Um, I think it, it's it's quite easy to give me all the credit because people see me in the background, you know, in our organizing group running around doing this, doing that, and the guests see me actually inviting them. But to be fair, I couldn't do anything that I've done, none of it, without at least, you know, 50 people have right. been involved in putting this together. You know, we've got 25 guests. We've easily, we've probably got in excess of 25 uh, people organizing in the background. We have like a, a tech team. We have a social media team. We have like Facebook mods, YouTube mods, Zoom mods. We've got people on OBS restreaming to 12 different platforms. We've got so much support. We've had graphic designers, all these amazing graphics that you see. I didn't make them. You know, the, it's not, I'm not the person putting like the streams together and doing the restreams. So behind me, I'm sitting here and you know getting kudos but behind me there is dozens and dozens and dozens of people who have for no money for no benefit other than the true cause of fighting for Julian's freedom have given their time given their resources given their skills to make this happen so and I, I, I did not mean to take away from them at all <laughs> I just noticed that you especially were in the group saying I really want to make sure that I have people from all over the political spectrum and that was more so what I was trying to compliment was that you so, really pushed for that and I thought that I, was so I pretty much stopped I I pretty much I I just looked at what I've seen work and occupy 2,000 cities in two weeks you know why why did it spread so far why did it spread so fast how were we able to get tens of thousands of people into one place at one time and it was because we didn't say this is, you know, a progressive movement for Democrats, or this is a libertarian movement for privacy activists, or this is an environmental movement for the Greens. Like we allowed everybody. There was there was no qualification to join in other than physically attending and giving your time, your resources, and your skills. So I'm just really trying to apply that same model to this movement. And I think the other key to a successful mass movement is sustained action. So it's not enough to just like, like women's march, right? We go have a great big women's march, a couple million people. It's really fantastic. But then what happens next? Nothing. So yeah. there has to be sustained action. There has to be an event next month and the next month and the next month to really drive that message, to grow the audience, to grow the participants. And that's, I mean, for me, the greatest thing about this is last time we had, I think like 12 people or 14 people or something and did 10 hours. This time we've got, you know, 25 people and doing 25 hours. And I can just see like, you know, this time next year, it'll be a like week long conference with 150 people. And like, that's what we need to do. It's totally what we need to do. We, we need to evolve it and, and to bring in as, as many interested parties as possible. Yeah, I agree. That would be amazing. So the other thing I wanted to talk to you about the most was your massive being Julian article. That was just absolutely phenomenal. And how long did that take you, first of all? Um, it took me a little bit over four months. So about the first, I think, 10 weeks was like just research, like just reading and researching everything. I went right back through the entire Twitter timeline of not just WikiLeaks, but everybody who was mentioning or associated with WikiLeaks. I went through every tweet on the, you know, the Free Chelsea movement, then Free Bradley Manning um, hashtag, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And because I just really wanted to, we, we keep getting told by people and by media what WikiLeaks history is. And I just wanted to go back and refresh for myself what is the real history? You know, what was WikiLeaks really saying? What were they really doing? What actions were they really taking? Who were they really supporting? And then to see if that matched up with these narratives that keep getting pushed onto them. And I discovered that in almost all cases, no, they didn't match up at all. And that, in fact, there had been pretty much a wholesale whitewashing of WikiLeaks activism in terms of rallying support for whistleblowers and for at-risk journalists. And so often you hear um, accusations that Julian Assange is taking credit for this or taking credit for that. 
And each time I went and researched those accusations, I discovered that actually his uh, input and his efforts had been far beyond what he had ever taken credit for. And it just made it actually quite laughable to see these people who were baselessly trying to claim that he would, uh, Julian was just taking credit, you know, Julian's just arrogant or whatever. The evidence showed me that actually Julian is extremely humble. He has an unbelievable amount of humility. His achievements are not just historic, but they're incomparable to anybody else in the media sphere. I cannot think of a single example of someone who has had so much impact, global impact. And I mean, this isn't just about an election. I'm thinking about like Kenya, like, you know, even even prior to the Iraq war logs, governments right. were changing because of the truth that WikiLeaks was bringing to the people of those countries. And journalists were at risk and journalists were lo losing their lives long prior to 2010 as well. It, this has been a very serious battle of truth versus lies that goes back now well over a decade. But much of that history is hidden. When you go and read the Wikipedia page for WikiLeaks, you'll come away with a very different impression than right. you'll get from than you would get from going back and reading through WikiLeaks publications and releases in sequential order, and from their social media feeds and the Twitter history, not of just of them, but the general commentary of, of observers at the time is so different from the supposed history that has been manufactured in Wikipedia to influence public opinion about WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Right. What do you think was the most surprising or shocking thing that you found when you were doing your research? Like, what was your favorite thing, you know? I wouldn't call it my favorite, but for me, the most shocking was actually the tur the turnover time between a smear piece being written about WikiLeaks and then it appearing within the first like 20 um, res source results on the Wikipedia page. It was literally within 24 hours. So you would have this big, oh my God, WikiLeaks scandal smear in the MSM and then wham, it's on the Wikipedia page. It's, you know, in the second or third paragraph and it's being heavily referenced. So that page is always being kept up to date with the most current WikiLeaks smear. But then when I went and researched the smears one by one, for example, the Atlantic article, Julia Ioff's Atlantic article about the uh, supposed DMs with Trump Jr., I mean, that was sold to us as like breaking news, massive leak about WikiLeaks, you know, the, none of us knew this was happening, blah, blah, blah. And then I discovered that Julian had openly tweeted about the conversations that they'd had right. and the contents of the conversations months before the Atlantic smear on WikiLeaks. And so it's just like these things are unbelievable to me because then Julia Ioff's on all the major cable news networks and they're openly, you know, they're telling her, this is an incredible scoop and what unbelievable like gumboot journalism, you know, gumshoe investigative journalism you've done here. And then you discover like Julian had been openly discussing these things for months. None right. of it was a secret. None of it was a secret. None of it was unknown. No leaks were required. Like it was and and it, it's unbelievable. He's, he's, he was building sources. Like that is what everybody should be doing. Like, you want to have sources. You want documents. He was trying to get information. That's what you do in news, you know? Yeah, but I've had, I've had a few friends that have went through similar things with Wikipedia. They'll have, like, tweets backing up, you know, everything that they say, but they can't counter this hit piece. And uh, Wikipedia is always like, no, that's not a real source, you know? And it's like, but it came right from the person. <laughs> And it, I really hate the way, the system that Wikipedia has for only allowing certain news outlets and certain sources because it it really does a disservice to information. It is it's heavily um, heavily weighted against independent sources. Right. So at the end of the day, you it's just regurgitating corporate spin and corporate junk. It's really like an aggregation for the cable news networks at this point. Um, and that's really tragic because that's not at all what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be focused on, you know, academic papers and research papers and all of these types of things. And um, I, Elizabeth was saying earlier, for, there's 48,000 instances of case law that have been impacted by WikiLeaks publications. 
you would think that would be at the top of the Wikipedia page, but it's nowhere to be found. I didn't even know that. I missed that part. That's pretty shocking. Yeah. They've had an absolutely incredible impact on international law around the world, not just in their own cases or Julian's own case, but the cases of other people who have been able to prove everything from corporate malfeasance to war crimes on the basis of WikiLeaks releases. Their, their contribution to the historical record is just impossible to describe the significance of. Yeah, I always say that they've done more in the last 10 years than legacy media has done in 100 years. And I really firmly believe that it's just such an impressive body of work. And he's so important. And I mean, everybody at WikiLeaks is just so important. When we spoke earlier to, or when Elizabeth spoke earlier to Greg Barnes, who is the Australian legal advisor to Julian Assange, he was congratulating Julian's legal team on having worked on an unprecedented case in unprecedented circumstances, e extremely strenuous, tenuous circumstances. Um, and I think that's something that often um, goes underappreciated is how, just as I was saying before, like, you know, behind me, there's like dozens and dozens of people giving of themselves. It's exactly the same situation with WikiLeaks and with Julian. Behind Julian, behind WikiLeaks is an uncountable number of people who make personal sacrifices and take personal risks, risks they shouldn't have to take because they, they shouldn't have to fear extrajudicial punishment. But the reality is there is extrajudicial punishment leveled at anybody who supports whistleblowers, truth tellers and at-risk journalists. And those people are fearsome and brave and very seldom do people even realise that those sacrifices are being made every single day, but they are. WikiLeaks is not just about Julian. Julian has had to be the face of it. In fact, he, I mean, he openly admitted that he stepped forward as the face of WikiLeaks to try to become a lightning rod to take heat off other people. And that, that is phenomenally brave on his part. And I know that he is well aware, he said several times, that people who take truly principled moral stands don't live long. He, you know, he knows throughout history they don't live long. You, it's not often that you can take moral stands on the global stage in the way that he has and, you know, expect to live out your retirement in Cape Cod in your 90s. It's not going to happen. Uh, he's well aware of that and he does it anyway because it's the right thing to do, even if it's at his own expense. And that is the definition of courage and sacrifice. Yeah, it's true. And it, yeah, <laughs> I really worry about his health. And I think that that's not being discussed enough. I mean, it is here, but in general, I, I, I feel like everybody kind of glossed over the fact that there were doctors pleading with the public, like with the government to let him go to a hospital and they still didn't allow it. Like what kind of inhumane society allows something like this like i mean we allow death row inmates to get medical treatment um it's just it's shocking and appalling that this can actually happen to somebody it's archaic yeah it is archaic and this is exactly what they're going for now right is like the stoning in the public square you know they want to put them in shackles and have people throw rotten tomatoes at them this really is what the role of the mainstream media is in all of this they are the ones throwing the rotten tomatoes at, at the, you know, the dissident and the stocks in the public square. Uh, right. They do it shamelessly. Um, right. Putting out stories, saying these smells bad and stuff, which he does not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just well, it's so, like, it's, like who? It's who like burn the witch, that? right? Oh. Huh? It's like burn the witch. Like you think about the witch trials and then you ask yourself, what would CNN's role be? in the in the Salem witch trials yeah. or like what would they be, what would they be publishing in the paper you know what would the Washington Post be publishing in the paper during the Salem witch trials that's what these guys are they're the propagandists for the persecutors right and Julian is the I, I said earlier that Julian and WikiLeaks inoculate the intel the role of the intelligence agencies and I think that they inoculate the role of the mainstream media as well that uh, WikiLeaks is the antidote right to to that to the tyranny yes, it's so important so what would you what do you think that people could be doing more to help i mean people ask this constantly i'm sure you guys have talked about it already on the stream but 
aside from tweeting and writing letters, are there other things that people can be doing to help the situation or to even alleviate things for him a little bit? Is there anything? Oh, sure. There's countless things. So I'm not going to go over the ground that Elizabeth did. I uh, will give a very short one sentence synopsis. And that's that she said, use any skill that you have at your disposal to promote Julian's cause, whether that is art, whether it's writing, whether it is video editing, whether it is making music or, or whatever you can come up with that you have a skill and the resources and ability to do, do it and utilize it. Um, what I would say is that I just talked about the, the, good things that I learned that work about mass movements like like Occupy, um, but I've also learned what doesn't work. I've learned some very important lessons about like what they did wrong. And so um, I think the first lesson of that was that there, needed, there really did need to be one single achievable focus point for the movement. And so I think we're already doing that right because we know what we want. It's one single thing. It's something we can all rally around. Um, the second thing is, I learned that piling everybody together into a centralized organization, not that Occupy itself was centralized, but by physically standing in the same location, we were centralizing ourselves. It became a surveillance pen. People were able to be uh, identified and targeted um, because they were in that physical space. I would say that the second most important point is uh, decentralized mass action. Um, so that would mean not having a hierarchy within the organization and having people organize independently events um, all over the world as often as possible. And we already are kind of there. We've got the, we've got the seeds planted because, for example, there's the June 19 embassy, UK embassy vigils that are happening in a whole bunch of cities. They have absolutely nothing to do with Unity for J. And Unity for J has nothing to do with the Hash Free Julian campaign being run by Julian's lawyers, even though there's um, some Courage Foundation and some uh, of Julian's legal advocates appearing on our streams. They're not part of the organizing effort at all. So already we have these multiple uh, organisms, multiple organizations that are pushing for the same thing. Um, that have the same goal, but have different methods, different platforms, different organizational structures. This is a, definitely a strength. This makes it much, much, much harder. What we must never get in a situation um, of is where they can just pick off a leader and shut it down. And so the more groups that are simultaneously organizing at the same time, the stronger position we are all in. So take some initiative, take action. Nobody is your boss in this movement. You are your own boss. So come up with some great ideas, work with whoever you want to work with. And the other thing is that um, when you generate any content relating to Free and Julian, send it to Cassandra Send it to me, send it to at Suzy3D, S-U-Z-I number 3D, send it to Cassandra, at Cassandra Rules, send it to at Elizabeth Lee Voss, send it to at Wikileaks, at WL Art Force, at, at WL Task Force as well. We will help to extend your reach. We will use our platforms to promote your efforts if your efforts are honestly and sincerely in support of Julian. Our platforms belong to you. We will all amplify for each other. Um, so be aware of that and, you know, I'll do whatever I can in terms of circulating live event coverage or anything else that you guys produce. So, um, let's use our extended reach our, to reach, you know, the biggest audience possible combined across all of us. Right. Absolutely. I mean, the only reason I ever joined Twitter was to follow WikiLeaks. So I am always here to share WikiLeaks content and I, I want to know, well, it came up. Um, there's also going to be a White House um, rally on the same day, the six-year anniversary. So if people are in D.C., please come to the White House and join us. There'll be a lot of really amazing speakers and surprise guests and things like that. And it should be a really moving and touching tribute. So please come if you're around. <laughs> That is fantastic, and I'm so happy that that's happening. And um, in a sense, it's long overdue for us to be, you know, marching the streets of Washington Avenue, isn't it? <laughs> and sorry, Pennsylvania Avenue and Washington Avenue. Um, we need to have a physical pre uh, presence on the ground, definitely. Um, but absolutely different locations, different dates, different times, as much diversity of action as possible. We want to see projections on buildings. We want to see banner bridge drops. You know, we want to see um, 
sky writing. We want to see whatever, sand sculptures on the beach, you know, whatever you can come up with, just do it and send it out to the accounts and let's like, let's get this happening. Because I mean, free, uh, one thing, I actually know this from researching the Free Mandela movement and some of the activists I work with in New Zealand were associated with that original movement, even though I was in nappies when it was happening pretty much. Um, they fought for eight years. The original movement, I think, was more like 15 years um, in the making. But they fought long and hard for eight years to free Mandela. So this is not something that happens overnight, but it's something that it's like a snowball effect, right? So you have to start with that little snowball and you've got to push it and push it and push it and push it and push it. And one thing I really don't want is people getting disillusioned. I don't want people think because the thing is, it's tough work, you know, and um, listening to Kim earlier on, I understand why Kim's feeling down in the dumps about Julian's situation. This is a close friend of his and he's genuinely scared for, you know, his mortality, literally. But that said, when we built the GCSB movement in New Zealand, it took eight months of uh, full time campaigning to get to the point where it broke the story broke in the mainstream press. And once it broke in the mainstream pe- press, then we started public events. It was another 12 months before it was on the news five nights a week and it was the number one topic in the country. So that's the type of effort that we have to put into freeing Julian. It's not something we can just hope to do for one month or two months or three months. We have to make a sustained, consistent effort to push and push and push this narrative. Um, when Kim was campaigning um, on behalf of Latifa, the uh, UAE princess who had been illegally kidnapped out of Indian waters and, and taken back to, the, to Dubai, um, he asked me, you know, what's your best advice, Susie, for like how can I not let this, uh, stop the media from, you know, talking about this for a day and then forgetting it? And I said, how you do it is you talk about it every single day and you never stop. You never stop talking about it. And eventually they get the picture that you're not going to stop because always they will try to black it out first. They will try and pretend it's not happening. They'll try and wait a week or wait a month and see, you know, will the narrative change by itself? Can they get away with not doing anything about it? If you relentlessly push this issue and you make it clear that you are not letting this issue go, not only will more people become aware of it and get on board, but the media will learn. We're not going to get away with ignoring it. We're not going to get away with covering it up. This is still a thing. It's still happening. They're still organizing. The events are getting bigger. There's more events happening. Shit, what are we going to do? And that's the point at which they'll try to co-opt your narrative. So then they'll start um, publishing things like, oh, well, actually, Julian's not so bad, and we really quite like him very much, and maybe he should be free. However, let's try to divert all of your attention in this direction, you know, but we'll pretend that we're on your side. That's like step two for the media. And that's the point at which you then have to really just stick like glue to your original demand. Your, that This original demand of him being freed and able to reach his asylum is the most important um, conviction for us to have. And we must hold the media to account when, when it becomes, oh, well, maybe we could just reconnect him to the internet or oh, maybe we could whatever. That's when we really need to you know, make it clear we're not giving up until he has all of his human rights restored. Um, and eventually we will win. Eventually, when there is 10,000 people standing outside that embassy every day and people can't get into the Harrods entrance because there's so many people outside and all the car parks are full and they can't park their Bentley next to Harrods because of how many protesters are parked to camp out in their tents outside the Ecuadorian embassy, you will see how fast Theresa May will scurry to the press conference to announce that actually they're going to respect the UN decision. If we get to Occupy London going, I, I have a passport now. I'll like hop on a plane so fast. <laughs> With a tent. I'm so down for that, by the way, if anybody ends up organizing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'd love to join you. <laughs> um, Romola says in chat, Susie is absolutely right. We need a sustained effort. She says it will only happen, as I've described, if everybody makes a personal commitment to keep Julian in focus in our work in every which way that we can. 
And that's absolutely true. We must be tenacious. We must not let go of our goal and our single fight. And we must keep our eyes on that goal, not on who's doing what over there, who says what about who. Blah. These are all the distraction stuff, you know. Yeah. Oh, but Jack said whatever about whatever two years ago. So what? I want Julian free. I don't actually give a toss what someone said or what someone thinks or whatever. I want Julian free. Keep your eyes on the prize, you know, and, and we can get there. We absolutely can get there. This we can has already become normalized. In, in a big way. I mean, it's been over two months now. People aren't talking about it as much as they should be. This is something that should never have been normalized. It's not a normal thing. Like it's, if this was happening to anybody else in the world, any other publisher or journalist or reporter, there would be every organization on the planet, every human rights or group would be speaking out. Every free press group would be speaking out. But because it's Julian, it, I feel like it's just become normal. And it's so far from that. And it's so frustrating that I just want to scream at people all the time and be like, guys, wake up. This is not okay. Um, sorry, I just had to rant for a second. No, you, you're, you're totally good too. I mean, you and I, um, and maybe we should talk about this with our last 10 minutes or something that we have, but you and I are in a niche group of journalists who have been um, covering WikiLeaks and Julian for I don't know how many years now, a lot of years. And we haven't been doing it because an editor has been saying, okay, we want you to write this today. We're assigning you to this piece and this is the focus and this is the source you're going to talk to and, you know, send me back the draft because I'm going to edit it. This is not how Cassandra and my life works. We chase the stories we're passionate about. We do our own independent research. We write our own copy and proof our own copy. And then there's nobody changing our, you know, headlines or our content, poisoning the well, so to speak, of our content. Um, I would like to know, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't do this because you're supposed to be interviewing me, but I do, I would like to know, you know, what have you learned from, from seven years of covering WikiLeaks? I mean, I wasn't a journalist when I started following WikiLeaks and when I started speaking out for WikiLeaks or on behalf of WikiLeaks and Julian and things like that and Chelsea Manning. Um, I was an audio engineer. <laughs> I like was really into physics. I was not, I never wanted to be a writer at all, but I was seeing all these things that were wrong and being mistold improperly. And I just started venting about it on social media and people were listening and it, inspired me to write like I would not be a writer if it wasn't for WikiLeaks <laughs> I mean it they and I think that this is a case for a lot more people than than people than the public would think like WikiLeaks really inspires people and they bring out this great creativity and desire to do more it's like he always says courage is contagious it um, yeah, they've been my, my huge inspiration and I forgot where I was going with that because I just rant <laughs> and I didn't get any sleep last night. Um, yeah, I'm totally cool with you ranting and I think that you just made a really excellent point because the single greatest moral support for me when I was in New Zealand as, you know, this gonzo journalist on the ground covering actions being censored by the mainstream media in New Zealand, fighting an uphill battle on all fronts to raise awareness for the causes that I was working on, um, and being personally targeted and politically targeted for my work, the greatest moral support that I got was from WikiLeaks recognizing and sharing my work and my messaging to this massive international audience of millions of people. Because in one tweet, WikiLeaks could destroy the censorship, the containment strategy being applied to me by the New Zealand government and the mainstream media. So for all the efforts that they went to to suppress my messaging in New Zealand, WikiLeaks would just blow it open, blow the lid off it in one tweet. And for me, that was like the heavens are opening, like the cavalry is coming, like the message is getting out. This is worth something. This is actually people are hearing it. It's worth the sacrifice. The messages are getting through. That was incredibly important, incredibly important. 
there is a couple of other outlets and a couple of other major journalists, Glenn Greenwald being one of them, who also their support meant the world in terms of them also giving using their platforms to amplify for those journalists. So I think that's another thing that we need to bear in mind is that we also now have that responsibility to share the important messages that other people are making sacrifices for on the ground to get out. Uh, we need to um, imitate WikiLeaks in that respect because they, they're willing. I mean, you think about any other news, no other major news org would do that. Right. Would, would support, I, mean, would support I remember when we were out in the streets for Kelly Thomas and we would have like five people at a protest and we would just have some signs. There was no press at all whatsoever. And we would just start tweeting about it and WikiLeaks would come and retweet it. And all of a sudden we'd have press asking us questions and covering the case. Like they would, they used to set, I mean, they still do. They set news cycles and it's a very powerful like ally to have this massive platform that cares about the truth. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear what you I said. I completely agree. I completely agree with you that WikiLeaks has been a news service, and that's something I saw too when I went right back and read through their, their public history again, was um, constantly they're bringing where censorship exists not just censored documents but where any form of censorship exists wikileaks has been um intervening mm -hmm. they've been publicly intervening and i mean the uh, catalonia the movement to free catalonia is a classic example when i was in berlin i was speaking at the uh, chaos communications camp in berlin in 2015 um or just outside of berlin technically um there was some really cool activists staying in the tent next to us and they were wonderful people. One of them was from Barcelona in Spain and the other one was from, was Catalan, was from Catalonia. And they were telling us all about this movement and how like, you know, the struggle had gone back decades and why they were struggling and everything else. So when I saw um, Julian tweeting about Catalonia, I instantly recognized that um, he had been aware of this issue, you know, the, the full history of this issue. And as we can see from, you know, the tweet that supposedly got him in all the trouble that dated back to the World War II period or the pre-World War II period. Um, and you understand that Julian was truly representing the interests of the inter international activism community on mm -hmm. uncountable issues and where the extreme censorship existed, even if it wasn't, that WikiLeaks have been given documents or given something that they could publish as a release, they're still stepping in and, and advocating for those activists and making sure that the, those critical messages that people are sacrificing for are making it through into the public sphere. Right. And that, that's invaluable. I mean, I mean, there's, you can't put a price on that. It's such an important service almost, you know, we just, we really need them. We need him to be free. <laughs> But how did you first get into WikiLeaks? I don't know if I've ever asked you that. Um, I first just like started reading about them, must have been like 2009 and thinking like, huh, I like this. Like, this is great. Like, it's, because I'd always been pretty, I'd always been anti-war. I mean, my entire country is anti-war inherently. I'd always, I, I grew up in an era where we said we kicked the US warships, nuclear warships out of our waters, where we actually left the Five Eyes intelligence um, arrangement in the 80s. This was my formative years were at a time where New Zealanders believed extremely strongly in their national identity, where they weren't subservient to other nations, where they were fiercely independent, much like the Catalonians actually. Um, and that, I want to say that's our kaupapa. This is an a indigenous Maori word, New Zealander. It's our fundamental understanding. This is our kaupapa. We are an independent nation. We will not be bullied by the US. We will stand up for what's right and we'll take these moral stands and we'll march in the streets if we have to. You know, New Zealanders physically fought on the streets of, of cities throughout New Zealand against armed police um, on the anti-racism, anti-Springbok tours. We fought police uh, over the nuclear issue so that we could become nuclear free. Um, this is the heritage of my country. So I'd always had these seeds in me that aligned with WikiLeaks principles. So when I saw WikiLeaks, um, it was like a, a natural, I had a natural affinity for them. Uh, it wasn't until I accidentally, literally accidentally became a journalist um, in 2000, I guess 2010, I was. I remember sharing all their work on Facebook and whatnot, just sharing it on social media. But in 2011, during Occupy, while well, I was covering Occupy movement and I started blogging and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, 
um, that was when I started to not just follow and read about and share WikiLeaks work, but to actually write about WikiLeaks. And this was at the period that, um, you know, it was a couple of months post the Pentagon manhunt. Um, and it was at the first, you know, the height of the, um, of the serious legal troubles that uh, were being faced by Julian and by WikiLeaks. And Chelsea Manning at this time was in prison. And that was when I started to get really, really, really active. Then uh, everything converged with the FBI raid on Kim.com's house, which was uh, his mansion, which was a couple of days prior to the FBI raids of Occupy in New Zealand, uh, the and New Zealand police raids of Occupy New Zealand, I should say. And um, as I began to investigate that and investigate the FBI and then other intelligence agencies, my, my work just naturally got closer and closer to the sphere that WikiLeaks operates in. Um, and by 2013, you know, through Snowden in 2014, moment of truth event with Kim and Edward Snowden, Julian Assange and Glenn Greenwald, um, I was producing content that was completely counter to the mainstream mar- narrative about what was going on and WikiLeaks was amplifying that work to the world and that was absolutely huge and I think I was only like the second journalist, I think only really Nikki Hager in New Zealand had ever had the work shared by WikiLeaks so that was what really propelled me into uh, beginning to have my own following and platform and audience and reach that was given to me by WikiLeaks. I owe any audience I have now, any reach that I have now, I absolutely owe to Julian and to WikiLeaks. And that's why I will continue to, until my you know, dying day, I will continue to use my platform and my reach in whatever way I can to drum up support for WikiLeaks and for Julian Assange. I'm simply returning the solidarity that they showed me and my country in the trials that we were facing. Absolutely the same. I couldn't have even remotely said it as eloquently, but same. I feel like I owe them so much and I will fight for him forever. So I don't know. I think you guys have another person, so I should probably <laughs> be heading out of here. Sandra, whatever, 400 tweets a minute to zero instantly. It was shadow banned. We complained about that to Jack and to Twitter and it got, unshadow banned temporarily but you can guarantee this is the information that the powers that be do not want out and do not want people hearing and the best way to counteract that is by sharing it to every single person you know on every single platform and if you are censored on facebook and twitter try using a telephone and calling people and talking to them text them the link to the video send emails to people go and post it on forums and websites and in chat groups and news groups Think up inventive ways. God, go on Call of Duty and get in the chat and stick the link to this. Like, you can come up with some really subversive ways to share this content. We don't need to just be reliant on the big social media companies to to be able to 